Morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, the South African Chamber's uh, regular events that we are holding by webinar. And it's wonderful to see so many of you who have joined us. Many more have registered, so hopefully we'll have a few more coming in in a, in a moment. Yes, there we go, quite a few more joining us. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to the South African Chamber and specifically to the Isle of Man. Uh, we're sitting here in the UK, freezing cold, white outside, everything has frozen, and I understand they are equally sunny and cold in the Isle of Man today. So first, a uh, bit of health and safety, please. Um, we'd love some interaction from the audience, but please can you do it via the Q&A function? Uh, that will allow you to post your questions to me. I will then be able to put those to the um, two panelists so that we can ensure that the topics of interest to you are covered in the Q&A session at the end. We're going to start with presentations, some short conversations before we get to Q&A and we finish in an hour's time. I know the Isle of Man very, fairly well myself. Uh, they haven't quite convinced me to go live there yet, but it's very, very, very compelling, except I can't move my house from where it is in the UK there. Otherwise, I probably would go. But I was there on Midsummer's Day doing the parish walk one year, and I have to tell you, it was as cold as it is today that day. Um, it is a beautiful place, and I love the angels. They always talk about the angels there, which are really, really wonderful. It's a place of lots of stories, and you're going to hear different stories, though, from our people today. I'd like to now uh, request our panelists to come on, on view. I'd like to just introduce uh, John Hunter to you first. Uh, John Hunter works for the finance department of the Isle of Man, and our second presenter is going to be Nick Presky, who is going to share with us um, about the complexities of immigration. But to start with, John, I'm going to hand over to you so that you can give us some insights on why the Isle of Man is the jurisdiction of choice for people that are not yet come to your beautiful island. Lovely, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is well and safe and, and naturally the thoughts of everybody in the Isle of Man goes out to anybody who may be having a difficult time at the moment. Uh, as Sharon said, I'm the head of banking and fiduciaries for the Isle of Man, but also I have some country responsibilities for, for the beautiful country of South Africa, for which I'm, I'm ever so grateful. Uh, I thought I'll just talk through a bit of background about the historical links between the Isle of Man and South Africa. Uh, and why the Isle of Man is such a special place um, at the moment, particularly when we're living in quite uncertain and unstable times, um, about how the Isle of Man actually has become a, a bit of a safe haven. So I'm going to start with, if I can get my slides to work, I'm going to start and talk about the historical bonds between the Isle of Man and South Africa. And they go back to around the 1870s when the deep open cast mines closed in the Isle of Man, and a lot of uh, Manx miners actually relocated to South Africa. One was Joe Mill Creest, who went to Kimberley, uh, and he had such a good time, he asked his buddy Dan Corlett to move down from the Isle of Man. And between the two of them, they created the largest construction firm in the Transvaal. Dan Corlett from the Isle of Man went on to become the mayor of Johannesburg, and I think by the cricket ground, you'll find Corlett Drive, um, so, you know, that's a, that is a very, very, very strong connection in terms of, of the Isle of Man with Johannesburg. Um, but Philip Moore from the Isle of Man arrived in South Africa in the 1920s, and he became the opposition minister, having been elected to the Parliament for Education and Finance. And it was actually Philip Moore from the Isle of Man who introduced a bill that decimalised the South African currency and effectively introduced the RAND. So the Isle of Man can claim in some way responsibility for the RAND, although I'd hesitate to say we would not claim responsibility for its performance. Um, Philip Moore went on to become the first president of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And funnily enough, he was succeeded by a chap called Willie Long, who was born of parents from the Isle of Man. Um, so we have long um, historical bonds and closeness with South Africa. Um, and we have a thriving South African population here. I believe it's around about 7,000 people of South African descent that have relocated and now live in the Isle of Man. Um, the Isle of Man, the Isle of Man is an independent, self-governing country. We are, however, a crown dependency. We rely on the UK for our foreign policy and protection. Um, we're entirely self-funded. We have no national debt, in fact, 
our governments are not allowed to budget for a deficit. So they have to budget purely on the basis of the revenues that are raised through the economy. The island has healthy reserves. Um, it still has a Moody's AA2 rating. Um, and it has the lowest crime rate in the child, so I believe that is actually in Europe. Um, why do we see the Isle of Man as a jurisdictional choice and natural choice for people to consider when structuring either their financial affairs or looking to, 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 to relocate and come and live? Um, is that we have a, an amazing regulatory and international reputation. We have some amazing economic stability. The cost of living here is, is pretty good as well. And we're incredibly politically stable. And I'll talk a bit more about those issues um, as we go through. When looking at a jurisdiction, I've kind of pulled together a bit of, of, a, of a risk matrix, which would be useful for anybody to use when looking at, at, at potentially using a jurisdiction for wealth management purposes, for asset protection, or even um, as a jurisdiction to live. And the various constituent parts are, you clearly want to be in a jurisdiction that's highly politically stable. In the case of the Isle of Man, we have the oldest continuous parliament in the world. Um, and whilst that's nice, probably the really interesting factor is the politics in the Isle of Man. We do not have party politics in the Isle of Man. People are elected to the parliament based on them as individuals, not on their party politics. So what this provides for is a fairly stable, continuous, benign political environment. Don't get the swings of, of, of Labour, Conservative, right or left. It tends to be a very stable, continuous, and people become politicians here because actually they want to do the best for the island. Um, a real issue around at the moment is economic concentration risk. If you have a jurisdiction that is highly focused on one particular area and say comparative jurisdictions around the Crown dependencies and offshore territories, you could have as much as 80% of that jurisdiction being reliant upon financial services. Now, that puts it in a position of potential exposure to systemic economic risk. Um, and likewise, if it has 80% of its, of its GDP exposed to financial services, it could have a significant proportion within that 80% exposed to one particular area. So when looking at a jurisdiction of choice, it's really important to look at what that economic concentration risk looks like. As I talk through some of the other slides, you'll see the Isle of Man financial services at only 40%, and we have a well-balanced and diverse economy. Regulatory certainty, in, in a world where um, there's a need to, to, to ensure that anti-money laundering and countering finance for terror, terrorism is so high on the agenda for any offshore jurisdiction. Uh, the current round of inspections in terms of how you perform against international standards, most jurisdictions in the world are at level four. The Isle of Man, however, was one of the first countries to commit to doing the higher level uh, of assessments at level five. And we've come through that, uh, and we are believed now to have one of the world leading AML and CFT frameworks. Um, so regulatory certainty, but also coming to a jurisdiction that's, that's renowned for doing the right things, for transparency, uh, is so important. There is one country that recently went through an initial assessment on a level four and failed eight out of 10 of the initial measures. The consequences were that one of the major banks pulled out their correspondent banking facilities from that jurisdiction. So I think when looking at a jurisdiction of choice, a consideration needs to be given, is that jurisdiction still a level four? Is there a risk in that jurisdiction? Or is it a level five and can provide regulatory certainty? Cost of doing business, naturally very important. We are a island of 225 square miles with 85,000 people. We have an abundance of space. So, cost of operating here is not what you would imagine from a, some of the comparative offshore jurisdictions. The level of relative legal disputes is really important in the fact the, the, the Isle of Man law is based on UK and common law. Um, it's very easy to go to a jurisdiction 
which may be deemed to be low cost to set up your trust or to set up your wealth management or set up your planning. However, if the trust and company law is not clear, you could end up in, 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 in a court paying significant legal costs in order to unravel any disputes that arise. There's a very easy way to kind of test that is to have a look at the Supreme Court and see how many cases are sitting in the Supreme Court waiting for judgments around clarification of trust and company law. I can tell you the Isle of Man has very, very, very low and very few legal disputes in that area. Financial support from the government. The Isle of Man government is absolutely committed to, to bringing more business and more people to the Isle of Man. We have the ability to operate to, to offer up to 40% grants for businesses coming to the island to set up, to operate and to create jobs here. Um, we're seeing an abundance of new businesses coming in across a whole variety of, uh, of areas from financial services, from financial technology, to mobile technology, to law, to accountancy. Um, and they are being supported heavily by the government. Substance requirements under the EU listing group are incredibly important as well. So has a jurisdiction got the ability to, to meet the substance requirements? Clearly in the Isle of Man, we have got a very respected uh, tax regime and we have adequate space and people for businesses to create real substance. So that's kind of a bit of a framework that says what you should be looking at in a jurisdiction. Uh, the Isle of Man, as I've said, is 85,000 people, but we have 4,200 businesses here. We're the headquarters to the likes of Microgaming, uh, Derivco, Old Mutual International, Zurich, Ned Bank Private Wealth are headquartered here. Standard Bank have a large operation, and we work really closely with the Standard Bank team in South Africa. Investec are present here. So these are all bonds that bond between the Isle of Man to South Africa quite strongly. Um, we have Capsule International, an Isle of Man based business that's just opened offices in both Johannesburg and Cape Town. So we see this as a very much as a two way relationship in terms of working together um, and bringing investment back into South Africa ourselves. Um, financial services, 400 financial services team. It's 40 percent now in terms of, of economic um, uh, GDP. Diverse, covering banking, investments, insurance, pensions, uh, and fiduciary. And as I've mentioned, we are we do have the headquarters of some of the most respected financial services brands. Uh, we are internationally recognised for our work uh, in terms of tax avoidance. We were first to sign the FATCA. We were first to sign the OED Treaty against tax avoidance. We're the first to non-EU country to automatically share beneficial ownership. We continue to work to be at the forefront. We're currently developing information sharing with, with uh, financial crime agencies, and we're working really closely um, across the world in terms of ensuring that we are a good citizen. The economy, there's the kind of a breakup of the, of the economy. We have agricultural, manufacturing, we make aircraft parts, we have e-gaming, we have banking. It's a well-balanced and mature economy. So, as I mentioned, we have an aerospace cluster here making parts for aircraft. We have specialized lens manufacturers, tourism, of course, most probably be aware of the, the TT motorbike racing. Uh, but really, the infrastructure is so important in supporting all of those things. We have unlimited, unlimited self-generated power abilities. We currently have an ability to generate 200% of our peak electricity demand. And we do export electricity into the national grid in the UK. We have uh, fibre broadband. We were used as the test bed for technology for 3G mobile phones. So the infrastructure that sits behind everything is so important in being able to deliver that well-balanced economy. Just a few interesting points for you. The island does have a real history of innovation. Uh, Pilates was invented here in the 1900s. Um, unbelievably, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution was founded in the Isle of Man. We're actually the first whole jurisdiction to be named UNESCO Biosphere, and that's the government's commitment to protecting the environment. And we've created a number of sea reserves around the island um, and have a very proactive 
and positive policy around flora and fauna. The Isle of Man was the first national parliament to give women the vote in a general election back in, back in 1881. Uh, so it's a jurisdictional choice. I hope that's kind of given you a bit of a flavour for the Isle of Man in terms of why it should be a natural choice for you when you're considering financial planning, even business uh, location. You know, it's a strong, pragmatic and business friendly regulation economically strong, we can meet substance uh, requirements quite easily, and we have an incredibly supportive government who is very, very open to business. If I can encapsulate the Isle of Man in several words, it's, it's strength, security, stability and service. At a time when we're going through so much disturbance in the world, we see, we see ourselves as a haven, uh, a haven of safety, security and stability. I started talking about the relationship between the Isle of Man and South Africa. I'd kind of like to finish on the same theme. Uh, the Isle of Man is committed to, to, to supporting and investing, and we have a very proactive international development policy. We may be a small island, uh, but we believe actually we should be giving, giving something back where we can. We've recently completed a renewable energy, energy project empowering women farmers in Zimbabwe, uh, which committed a fairly sizable budget to improve the agricultural productivity and try and lift some of the households in Zimbabwe out of poverty. Similarly, the Isle of Man runs the Small Countries Financial Management Programme, which is about helping smaller com companies, com sorry, smaller countries follow the Isle of Man model in terms of establishing their economies, in terms of helping them develop economically. Um, and, and a few African countries that have benefited from this programme so far have been Botswana, Lesotho, uh, as, as, as on the screen. So we believe that the relationship between the Isle of Man and, and Africa as a whole, and particularly South Africa, is a strong, it's a long uh, and a very close one. Um, and of course, I'd be naturally just delighted to speak to anybody around any of those, those kind of subjects. That's very much me, Sharon. I know, I, know, I know that was a very, very quick canter through it. Through Fantastic. Language, but uh, what you leave me with, you left us with those four words. I'd like to change those and leave you with something else. And I'm sure, sure. others will appreciate it is low crime no politics, plenty electricity, what's not to love? <laughs> if you think of the things that South Africans tend to have to deal with um, are those three things. And uh, the other aspect is uh, the fourth one that I wanted to add was a, a self-generating economy that is not allowed to be in debt. I thought, well, there's pretty good reasons why we can look at this country versus some of the other countries we all live in and how they don't achieve that. One question I just want to ask you quickly, how has the island responded and coped e economically with the COVID environment? How have businesses managed? Um, I know the people have done fantastically well. You've hardly been locked down at all other than your little fire break you've just had. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been unbelievably well managed in that respect, but economically, how's that gone? Surprisingly, economically, it's, it, it's gone very well for the island. Um, our government reserves a few weeks ago were actually higher than they were pre-COVID. Um, Business has adapted really well. We have great, great broadband across the island, so the switch to home working is really easy. Um, we've actually seen an uplift and an increase in business interest in the island as a result of the fact that we have been able to adapt and get back to life as quickly as normal. Um, so it's, 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 it's been hard for some people, I know, and, and difficult. And, and we have seen a loss of life here as well, which we must remind ourselves is that there are people who, who have had a difficult time here. Um, but generally, the economy's performed OK. Um, and the feeling is, you know, it could have been worse. Absolutely. Well, I must admit, I have been a little jealous when we've been talking about how we're putting together our black tie dinner together and you guys are going to do it in a restaurant and we are going to do it at home. So we are with another good reason for uh, people to be jealous. There are a couple of questions that are coming through, uh, which I'm going to pick up towards the end. 
Um, one of the things that in work and business that I've done and handled with the Isle of Man in the past is finding it sort of quite procedurally driven, quite antiquated with old fashioned methods and things. Now I understand in the last couple of years that has changed somewhat in the Isle of Man. Absolutely. I mean, we're continually reviewing everything that we do in terms of regulation, but there is actually a lot to be said for being safe, steady, secure. Um, there's a lot to be said for, for, I mean, I talk about the historical uh, bonds between us and, and South Africa. Yeah, history is quite a good predictor of, 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 of the future. Um, we believe that safety and security and stability are the, all the things that we want to be. You know, we are a hub for innovation and we do like development and we have a very pragmatic regulator, a highly supportive, incredibly commercial government, to be, to, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the last the last set of politicians that came in probably brought the most commercial approach to our government we may well have seen ever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a, a slow, steady change. We're not a reactionary, uh, revolutionary environment, uh, but we are adaptable, we're flexible, and we can move quickly and be nimble when we need to. Mm. I've got a few more questions, which I will keep till later. We've got a couple of them coming through, um, which are going to be applicable to Nick and to yourself. So maybe at this point, Nick, we can maybe talk about the more complex area of, um, a complex area of immigration, uh, the individuals, companies moving into the island. And I know you're going to be going through this in quite uh, quickly with quite a lot of detail. Just to let everyone know that um, both uh, panelists are happy to share their slides. Um, and just uh, contact us, contact them directly. We will be giving you email addresses in the follow up email that we will be sending out. So Nick, can I leave you to canter through the law, confuse us completely and keep it as simple as possible in the process? Yeah, well, what I will do, uh, I've only got about 15, there's 15 slides, but I'm going to, I'm going to fly through them uh, pretty quickly. As you said, you know, we can share them all. So don't feel like you have to take notes, but there are two slides that I want you to pay particular attention to. And uh, I'll, I'll point those out as we go through, but in, in essence, they're the main routes that are, uh, that are available. And, and hope from that you can you can probably see how they could be used. And I've got a slide at the end which hopefully brings them all together so you can understand the practical use of those routes. Right, okay. Right, well the Isle of Man, basically we have our own immigration rules. Or be it we are part of the British Isles, we still have our own immigration service. And as such, we have our own rules. Our rules are very similar to the UK's and as you'll see in a moment we actually apply online through the UK to come to the Isle of Man. The reason for that is at the end of the day we are British and you will get a British passport should you wish to uh, naturalise. This is one of the slides that I said if you are going to make note of this is this this is one of them. These are the main routes that uh, are normally applicable for people who are coming from South Africa. John kind of mentioned before about how diverse our economy is. He also mentioned about some of the big names that are here and some of them are actually South African. You know, I, I can say that I've actually worked with some of those companies and used some of the routes that you can see on, the, on, on, on my slide here today. By way, the far easiest route to get to the Isle of Man is probably the ancestral visa. So that's for anyone who is a Commonwealth citizen who has a, a grandparent that was born uh, in, in the UK. I've worked with quite a few people in the last 12 months that have come to the Isle of Man uh, via, via this route. So moving on from that, the, the second option is the tier one investor. Uh, I'll run through this in a little bit more detail uh, in, in a moment because I've got a slide on each one of them. So basically the tier one investor is, as it suggests, it's somebody who's got a large amount of money to invest into an Isle of Man entity. Um, and once you've made that, then there's, there's very few rules uh, beyond that. 
The, the second option I want to talk about is the business migrant group. Now, this has had a lot of interest from entrepreneurs. So it's people who might have a great idea who want to set a business up on the Isle of Man. This is the route that people can, can utilize. Once again, I will provide you with a little bit more detail in a moment. Well, the other routes is the representative overseas business. I think this is really interesting for say a, a company who might want to set a branch or subsidiary up into the Isle of Man. There's a way that you can parachute a, a key employee in to set it up. I'll talk about that in a little more detail too. And finally, the Isle of Man worker migrant route. So this can be used by South African companies that are here who wanted to bring people into the island, who want to say bring their cultures and values in, into their operation here. This is for skilled workers. Once again, I will go through some of the terms and conditions uh, of those. Right, in terms of the investor, this might be a, bigger, a bit of a tough ask at the moment in, in South Africa, where you've got to have a minimum investment of 2 million, but there may be people outside of, who have money outside of South Africa who could utilize uh, th this route. Basically, you just need to make an investment into an Isle of Man trading entity. That consists of having your own bank account, your registered head office here. And, um, you know, that, that's it basically. You can put your money into that. I'll show you in a, in a moment uh, on, on my next slide how, how you can do that. Uh, there are some pinch points here. Um, you can't be absent for more than 180 days. So if you were to set this company up and then go back to South Africa and then come back in sort of five years' time, that, that wouldn't work. You actually have to, to really live here. The beauty about the Isle of Man, we're part of something called the common travel area. So that means if you want to go to London, which is within the common travel area, the common travel area in essence is the UK, which is Scotland, Ireland, Wales, you've got the Channel Islands, us, and believe it or not, you've got Ireland in there who are, who are part of the EU, but this is a historic relationship that we have. So you can move around within that without generating any sort of absence. In terms of how it would look, well, it's quite simple. You'd form an Isle of Man company, which you can see in red in the middle of there. By definition within the, the rules, it needs to have its registered office here. Well, that's quite easy. You know, you, you can use your home address. Um, the company needs to be taxed in the Isle of Man. Well, all companies are taxed on the Isle of Man anyway. And what I would say is most of them are taxed at 0%. It, it's only the odd one that is taxed uh, above that. They're normally, sort of banks and exceptionally large retailers, people like the Marks and Spencers um, and the Tesco's, they're the ones that are, are charged tax and that's about 10%. So how would, you, how would you invest? Well, it's quite simple. You can either loan the money in or you can take shares. Once you put the money into the company, you can then make various investments to say, uh, you could be a money lending company or you could set up an investment portfolio. So there's different ways that you can actually, you know, invest that, that money. Right, onto the, uh, onto the business migrant. This is for the entrepreneurs. There's actually two classes here. The first one is the startup. The startup is really designed for the inexperienced entrepreneur. So it's probably like a graduate who's come out of uni, you know, they've been doing some, you know, interesting studies and probably got a great idea, but they don't have the entrepreneurial skill to decide how to, how to monetize that or how to set the company up and how to drive their idea forward. So the startup visa is really, you know, gives people that opportunity. What's key in all of this is that you must have a business plan and that business plan will show there's some innovation, scalability and viability. One of the questions that I normally get asked about is, well, Nick, what is innovation? How does that look? Well, basically we define innovation in, in three ways. One, is it unique to the island? Is this something new that we haven't already seen? Secondly, do you have a global client base? If so, fantastic. Obviously, you, you, you are sort of exporting your services, which is something that we're, you know, we're quite excited about. And thirdly, is this a form of import substitution? So if companies on the Isle of Man are having to go and buy stuff and bring it in, why not generate it here? So that's our wide definition of, uh, of, of innovation. As I mentioned before, on the other um, immigration route, there's the 180 day absence rule. So it's important that you're not absent from the common travel area for more than 180 days. 
and also English language is a requirement. It's unless you've had a degree taught in England at an, an approved um, um, an approved educational establishment, then you might need to take an English test. Uh, I, I think more often than not, the South Africans find it quite easy because you know English is either a first or second language for them. Right, on to the innovator. So this is really for entrepreneurs who, who've probably had a business before and understand you know, what it's like to try and get a business and get an idea off the ground. Once again, you've got to have a, a business plan with the similar characteristics. Innovation I've covered off. Scalability, when it comes to scalability, what we're looking at here is for real job creation. Um, now, the way that that works is after three years, they'll look back at uh, what jobs you've created. And ideally, we want somebody to have done is at least generated three jobs in, in that time for that last year. If you haven't quite made that, you don't need to worry. We can actually extend the, 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 the visa for another three years. You know, if there's some good reasons why you haven't been able to do that. Once again, our department will be in close contact with you on sort of like six monthly basis. Somebody will come and ask how, we, how are you getting on? That's not so much for, you know, with respect to sort of, you know, do we want, are, are you behaving or et cetera? It's not for that at all. It's to make sure that we can try and help you grow that company because it's in our interest to help you grow. Um, so this is, this is a route that I have actually worked with some South Africans on, but there is a, a minimum investment requirement of £50,000. Um, so that's, that's probably one of, one of the pinch points is, is getting that money, money together. But we've seen it with you know, quite a few people coming from South Africa. I've mentioned on here that we, there's an endorsement requirement. Interestingly enough, our department actually endorses you and I'm, I'm, I'm part of that process. I'm not all the process you know i'm just part of it so if people do have an idea and people are wondering if it's something that uh, you know would be palatable to us by all means you know you can reach out to us and we're quite happy to discuss with you you know your idea and how we see it fitting here in in, in our economy right i mentioned before about the representative of overseas business john kind of mentioned some large south african names well, let's imagine that there's another company in South Africa that wants to set a company up here. What you can actually do, you can, you can actually parachute somebody in to set this company up. Um, this can be a branch or, or a subsidiary. The applicant that you put, the applicant is going to be the person who's coming to come and set the business up. He must be working full time in the company already, uh, must have been employed outside of the Isle of Man. And he should really be a, a senior employee, you know, so somebody who's, you know, getting close to board level. And there is a restriction is they cannot be the major shareholder. The visa is granted for, for three years and you can get indefinite leave to remain after five years. Basically, indefinite leave to remain means that you are free of immigration control, which is probably quite an important step because then, you know, you're free to do whatever you want and there's no restrictions on, uh, on, on your business or anything else. And once again, English language is a requirement. Okay, this is what we call the uh, skilled worker route. So imagine you've got a company and you, let's say it's a financial services company. You want to bring people in who know your services that you provide. This would be the route that you would use. What we would normally do is we'd, we'd expect you to test the resident labor market. That's just basically advertising the role. There are a lot of roles that you don't need to go through this, but it is a consideration because what the government would like to do and it's preferred to do is if there's somebody local can take that role, you know, utilize those people. And I think for companies that tends to make sense sometimes because it can be quite expensive, you know, if you're actually going to, to, to move somebody. So the first thing we need to do is look at the resident labor market test. The second thing is not all roles are available for immigration, but quite interesting. You all may have heard about that little thing called Brexit that's been going on. Well, Brexit's had the, had, had the opportunity to create more roles for, for people outside of uh, the UK. 
Our immigration rules were approximately 700 pages. As a result of Brexit, they've gone up to 900. And a lot of that is for including new roles that uh, you can now emigrate here for. You know, you can actually work in a hotel and, and things like that are now allowable, whereas before they weren't. So that's one of the positive sides that uh, Brexit has brought to us. In terms of how a company would do that, a company would need to apply to immigration just to get a certificate to say that they can employ the person. And once they've done that, the certificate will be given to the applicant and they then submit that with their, uh, with their immigration uh, application. Once again, English language is required and you get ILR after five years. This route is for a company that might be set up on the Isle of Man that is a brand, that has a branch or subsidiary in South Africa, they can actually bring people in on a short term basis. So they don't have to go through the resident labour market test. So if you need to bring somebody in to train up an individual, then you can use this route for it. Unfortunately, this route, there's no indefinite leave to remain because it seemed very much as a short term opportunity, a short term route, a training route to train you know, other members of staff. Once again, the company to bring somebody in, you will need a certificate of employment. OK, this is the this is sort of my next to last slide. And this is the second slide that people should try and remember, because what I'm trying to do is bring alive all those those routes that I've talked about and, and show you a practical application. So in this particular example, we've got a South African a telecoms company that wants to set up a, a branch and subsidiary in the Isle of Man. So it set up its, its subsidiary and it needs some investment. So as you can see at the top right there, we've got a tier one investor who's put his two million pounds into this entity. Right, the South African company wants to bring some culture and values with it. So it wants to bring a CEO with it. So they can bring in the CEO via the representative of overseas business. The CEO would be the person who could form the company, you know, start getting systems in place, start leasing property. So he's really going to be central, but he can he can be parachuted in to do that. And then we need a, a chief operating officer. I mentioned before about the ancestral visa. So if you've got a grandparent that was in the UK, you can actually you know, bring them in under this route. The ancestral route means that you need to, you have to offer yourself up for work because that's, that's, that's what part of the visa requires is that you're going to be willing to work. So you can bring in somebody on the ancestral visa. Now this company has some sort of quite serious tech that they develop themselves. So they're gonna need somebody like a CTO to come and uh, make sure that this is all set up properly and that somebody knows the where for all about their uh, the tech that they've got. Now, this person could come via the Araman worker migrant route. This is the one that uh, basically it's just for skilled labor. So what better place than somebody who's got those skill sets to bring them in? They'll be the only ones who know about the company's technology. So, of course, they were the ones who would who would get the job. John mentioned before, we've got quite a substantial finance sector. Well, we might be able to pick up the finance director, you know, locally. So let's just assume that that works that way. And finally, you've got somebody in the sales who, who needs to uh, appreciate the culture of uh, the African clients. So, you know, he could come via the Isle of Man worker migrant route once again and, and, and fulfill that role. So that's how you can sort of like bring all the routes together to try and you know form a company that has say a, a, a south african you know feel to it well i think that's just about me done yeah there's my contact details on there sorry if i've rushed through it it is quite dry i'm afraid but hopefully if you get the slides you can have a look through them and then by all means reach out and uh, you know drop me an email Nick, thanks very much. There are a couple of questions which uh, we will go through and um, pose to you in a moment, but just a question from me. S politically, sometimes there's quite a lot of negativity in the UK towards foreigners coming in, taking local jobs, that kind of attitude. You see that in South Africa towards some of the foreign countries within Africa. 
too many people coming and taking local jobs. If you look at the ratio of South Africans, 7,000 to 85,000, that's a high number of South Africans alone, least of all any other um, uh, people from other countries, Europe and whatever. What is the local attitude towards the high degree of non-Manx people that now live there and are continuing to come in and either generate or take jobs? It's a great point. Right. But what, what we tend to find is they add a lot of value to our society, you know, in, in terms of, you know, tax take from a government perspective, the quality of life that that we that we have here. We don't we, we like to share it. But part of that is based on the tax take that the government gets. So we need companies to expand. We do have a thing called a, a work permit. So if people just want to come here or the resident labor market test. So it's not not truly a, a, a free market but in certain skill sets it is and and it's we are a cosmopolitan island we're an international finance center and as a result of that you know we, we have quite a diverse um population and it, you know it, it, it's quite welcome to be honest with you it's quite refreshing when you're walking around douglas on some of the shops you know there's no there's no movements or anything like that if anything it's the opposite they quite like that diversity that uh, it actually brings. Well, one thing's for sure, as they say in the classics, don't gossip, stroke Skinner yeah. in the streets of the Isle of Man, because somebody is going to understand you and be within earshot. Uh, there are a lot of South Africans and South African cultural things like food and things like that, which I know you have. But what is the capacity that the economy stroke physical island, the towns can take if you're 85,000 currently, what is the government's plan in terms of what can that population balloon to and still be sustainable at a non-borrowing position? Well, it's, it's quite interesting. I'm actually in a, you know, you can see uh, I'm, I'm in the locating and we've been set up specifically to try and attract people. So I think that shows you the commitment that we have. And to make that commitment, obviously they look at infrastructure and, and, and things like that. I mean, we've got a hospital on the island and that's, that's being built to take uh, a population of about 120,000 people. So we've invested. Power stations as well, you know, we've invested, you know, heavily in those so that we, we, we have the, once again, we have the infrastructure there for a much larger population. When you look at how our government uh, stacks up its finances, you know, you've got no corporation tax, no capital gains tax, and we've got relatively low income tax. It's important that we do increase our tax take, hence why the locate team's here to try and attract people here. We've got a great stable uh, financial base, but obviously we're looking to try and grow it. Um, you know, and that's, that, that's, that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, you just alluded to something a moment ago um, about the lower tax rates, particularly the individuals also paying a lower tax rate than they might pay in the UK. Mm -hmm. So the, the question that I would just like to ask is your cost of living is lower, your taxes are lower, but can I make assumptions along the lines that salaries are potentially lower? So are people in a net net position? Yeah, I think you'll, you know, to answer that question, I think it, it's, you know, the UK has some huge variance in, in, in costs. For instance, if you were in London, as you probably know, you know, you've got your, your, your travel, you know, traveling to work can be quite expensive. Um, but I'd say we're on a par with somewhere like, you know, Manchester, Sheffield, Leeds, you know, the, the normal uh, areas outside of, say, a big city, uh, you know, our cost of living is, 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 is similar to that. Um, obviously, being smaller, travel costs are, are, are quite small. Um, our salaries, we we did a calculation across the board and, we, you know, we, we reckon we were about 14% higher than uh, those in the UK. I think reason for that is sort of our economy when you look at it a lot of its sort of financial services a lot of its gaming you know these are quite highly paid you know jobs and roles that perhaps you don't see in the UK so that's why I think we're skewed a little bit uh, that direction in terms of our salaries being a little bit higher than those of the UK. Okay well that's interesting um, maybe John you'd like to join us visibly now I'm going to pick up a couple of questions from the floor I see John has answered a few of them directly but those that I think are of general interest I might might ask again 
what is the key advantage of um, being in the Isle of Man versus being in the UK? And then there's another question that is very similar, stating if you're in the UK with a full British passport, you've got property in South Africa, why would you now want to be in the Isle of Man versus remaining where you are in the UK? So if we can answer both those questions, that would be very um, advantageous for everybody. Right. Can I can I pick up uh, somebody who was in South Africa with a property in the UK? Um, what, what what would say there is we the UK have quite um, difficult uh, quite a, a, a tough tax regime uh, in terms of uh, inheritance tax. So you say you know you've, you've got a property there. Okay, if it's your main residence, it, it won't be a tax. But anything else outside of that, if you've amassed assets. Uh, then there's an opportunity if they are, re you know, of a reasonable amount that they can actually come and, and then tax you on that. I mean, a big example is if you're an entrepreneur, you've set a company up, you know, and you've gone from zero to something that's worth, you know, 10, say 10 million pounds on value. If you were to sell that in the UK, that could be quite, you know, that could be quite costly from a tax perspective, but in the Isle of Man, you wouldn't be taxed on that. So I think it, depending what your circumstances are, the Isle of Man could work really, really nicely for you. You know, a lot, a lot of businesses today in the digital space, you, you could almost be based anywhere, to be honest. So why not set yourself up in an area that is, is, is tax friendly? Um, you know, but we still have the challenges to run our economy based on the reduced tax. You know, hence why we need to increase the population. <laughs> and, and Which then like grows the economy once yeah. again. John, yeah. is there anything you'd like to add in addition to some of the con content you've given directly? Um, um, or repeat some of that because not everyone might have read it. Um, in terms of the questions that we're receiving? No, just the, the specific question is if you are UK-based, yeah. UK passport and you have uh, a link still back to South Africa, you might have property in South Africa, yeah. why would you want to live in the Isle of Man versus living in the UK? Because you seem to be able to move between the two quite readily and easily. I, I, it, to me, it comes down to one absolute reason. I came here 14 years ago, uh, having lived in the UK, having lived in Guernsey, and it's quality of life. Mm -hmm. 85,000 people in, in 225 square miles. It's the most welcoming place I've ever lived. Um, so for me, at the end of the day, the, the, the tax benefits are all, are all well and good. It's got to be a great place to live. And from my perspective, it is, a, it is, it is about where I want to live and where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And John, I know you've been achieving some trips to South Africa just before lockdown. And since lockdown, obviously the efforts to go to South Africa have been somewhat curtailed. What is your focus when you're going to be going next physically to South Africa? And what are you engaging in doing in the interim until you can physically go to South Africa? What are you looking to get from, from the country? Well, the purpose of my next scheduled trip to South Africa was July, was actually to come and watch the British Lions play rugby. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, that may not, that may not be happening. Um, but it's about a two-way flow, flow of business. Where I've already given some examples. We've got Nedbank Private Wealth headquartered here. Standard Bank. We're a massive generator of foreign currency for Standard Bank um, into South Africa. So for us, it's about a two-way relationship. It's understanding that actually you can have businesses here working with South African businesses. Uh, but also it's identifying people and businesses uh, who want to come and relocate and set up here um, and join us. And, and we're seeing quite a lot, but that's not about, I mean, one of the ones that both Nick and I have worked on recently uh, has been a legal firm who actually have set an office up in the Isle of Man, but retained the office in Johannesburg. So actually that's about a two-way flow of business. So it's actually, for me, it's about how we can work together uh, for mutual, mutual economic benefit. Mm. Uh, sounds wonderful for those that are interested. So through the chamber, we will obviously find as many connections and links to people in South Africa. So anybody with any interest, please contact the chamber as well, or obviously contact the, um, uh, both John and Nick directly. Um, the, I just want to see some of the other questions. There were some new ones that have come in. Let's just pick those up. Um, 
I'll answer one which says parking in Douglas at the moment is a nightmare yeah. because we've got some really large infrastructure projects going on. Once they're <laughs> finished, actually parking will be easier. <laughs> uh, I must admit your promenade along the front is actually such a lovely spot. Um, <laughs> The uh, from a tourist point of view, you obviously have the golf courses, the scenery, um, some of the coastal specialities you talked about. Uh, between yourselves, if you're looking at the tourist side, what do people tend to focus on from a touristic point of view on the island? Well, shall I go first, Nick? Yep, yep. Well, the golf, obviously, with, with nine golf courses here, here, we get a lot of people coming in for golf. The motorsport is huge. I mean, the Isle of Man TT is world-renowned. But actually, we have probably about eight weeks of motorsport here. The, the, the mountain is listed as a Sunday Times top 10 drive in the world. Um, and, of course, we don't have any national speed limits here. Mm -hmm. So getting up early in the morning and going for a blast across the mountain is just absolutely stunning. Um, My car needs to come for a visit. Absolutely. <laughs> but, I mean, there's all sorts of things. I mean, the, the, the walking, we have the historic railways here. So we have Victorian electric railways going to the north of the island, to the top of the mountain. We have steam railways. Cycling is huge. I mean, I love getting out on my bike, and I know Nick, Nick does. He's better than me. But... Um, uh, cycling is huge. It's a whole diverse uh, bird life, wildlife. We have the largest population of wild wallabies outside of Australia. Uh, so days wallaby hunting is always always good fun for the children. Uh, so it's actually a whole diverse, uh, great restaurants. Uh, the sea obviously is is all around us. Yeah, can I just add anything? Yeah, I'd just like to add one thing. John mentioned there about wallaby hunting. It's not strictly wallaby hunting. <laughs> what you guys might think. Go and look for them rather than kill them. <laughs> it's wallaby spotting. <laughs> so it's the photographic version, not the, yeah. the rifle Absolutely. version. Well, well, I'll, I'll just give you a little <laughs> interesting ditty. When I was going to South Africa with John last time, I was, I was getting picked up very early in the cab. And the debate on the radio is whether or not they should call wallabies on the Isle of Man because they're now sort of getting quite rampant. So, you know, it's really interesting that you know, we've talked about safety, security. These are debates that we have on our radio stations. It's, it's about wallabies. It's not about, you know, car crime. It's not about theft. It's about, you know, different sorts of things. We did have a, a, a front page story about the post box being closed because the birds were nesting in it. Yeah. <laughs> the one question I wanted to ask if you look at some people's um, tax affairs, they're relatively complex. They've got properties in a number of countries, continents in the world. They live on multiple continents and countries in the world to the nature of their work or their pleasure, whichever way it is. And if you've got somebody who's got both a South African and UK base connection, but they have global properties and global wealth, how does the inheritance tax system work such that you are not caught up by the UK one, South African one, others. Uh, and how do you protect yourself so that Isle of Man actually is where your tax jurisdiction is? And uh, you've got two, two, two separate issues there. Is one, becoming tax residents is relatively easy, but that's only in terms of uh, your direct income tax. Capital gains tax, however, on overseas assets, for example, I know in the UK, it's probably a seven year burn before you can remove yourself from any UK capital gains tax liabilities. Inheritance tax is all about your domicile, not your tax residence. So it's the country that you were born in, that you have, have had economic ties in. It's probably the, the, the country that your parents were born in. It's and, and probably the country that they're buried in if they if they predeceased. Um, so, you know, actually that test in terms of domicile, and it can normally take up to about 17 years to lose your, your domicile of origin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's incredibly complicated. And I would say actually professional tax advice is, is the only place to go for that. <coughs> Quite difficult to share. And I would guess the there's some quality tax advisors um, uh, on the island. Absolutely. You know, KPMG, PwC, Deloitte, uh, Ernst & Young, all got physical presences here and all got great links into their international networks of advisors as well. So they can buy global tax advice through the, the local tax offices. Here. And then you've got the likes of people like Maitland's being a South African or, uh, originated legal firm and 
trust firm. They, they're there. And I think there's some other South African based firms as well, aren't there? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, I think Ralph Odendell's probably quite well known in, in Cape Town and Johannesburg and Turnstone. Uh, Peregrine do an awful lot in, in South Africa as well. Uh, Optimus with, and Capital International as well. You know, it's a great story of an Iron Man company opening up offices and creating jobs in Johannesburg and Cape Town. So we have a lot of firms that have duality in terms of, um, and Nedbank, of course, Nedbank Private Wealth, they've got the Nedbank Trust Company as well. Uh, so there's an awful lot of connectivity between understanding both ends. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Nick, do you want to give us a closing <coughs> comment um, to complete your piece, to encourage people to come join yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we, we've got a great South African community over here. You know, we're more than happy, you know, so to see more people on. come here. You, yeah. you can. There's people that produce yeah. it. Um I'm not so sure I should really say this when we end up playing you guys at rugby. You know, it's uh, that's a bit of a sore point. Um, but you can see plenty of you guys, you know, out in the towns when when we're playing each other. No, for a more serious note, no, we're more than welcome. If you've got any queries or trying to understand, you know, what routes are available, just reach out. Um, you know, you, you've got my email. I'm more than happy to do, uh, you know, Teams meetings or anything like that. Everybody's welcome. And as John said, we're trying to build a bridge between the two. It's got to be symbiotic. You know, hopefully, you know, we, we can help people on that journey. Thank you, John, last comment from you. Uh, just, I, I'd just like to say hi to <laughs> Eric in Johannesburg, hi to Stuart and Marnie in Cape Town, because I've seen you're attending. Hopefully we'll be down to see you as soon as we can. Uh, but probably the most important thing at the moment is everybody stays safe and well. Uh, and we keep our fingers crossed that this vaccine is a pathway back to some normality for us. Um, and we'll look forward to being down as soon as we possibly can to come and see everybody. And adding to that, I think a lot of your attendees are UK based with similar interests to the South Africans and areas where we can support business growth and opportunities for the island as well. So looking forward to seeing you in London again, because that's the last time we saw each other was just before lockdown uh, here in, the, in London. So I'm looking forward to seeing you again here as well. But having met people in the round in physical personality once before makes this one a little easier. Nick, you and I have never actually physically met each other one to one. So there's this sort of flat person is never quite the same as the other one that you've met before. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. It's been very, very insightful for both of you. Um, and what I appreciated was the two different um, uh, content uh, that you shared with us from very different perspectives. So hopefully with a wide range of the audience and those that will be listening to the recording of this afterwards, that we'll be getting a lot of inquiries as to um, the value of coming to the Isle of Man. Uh, I have very, very close contacts with the island, having my stepdaughter and my uh, executive assistant both being on the island, and that's just the beginning. So I have very close connections. But interesting enough, haven't been there for ages as a result of the uh, crisis and being busy. So I look forward to coming to visit you as well and the fairies. So they're very beautiful. It's that bridge on the way to the airport. Yes, the fairy bridge. <clears throat> and Sharon, we'll, we'll look forward to welcoming you and... Uh, and, and showing you what's new, actually. And welcome as a new member of the Chamber. Thank you very much for your support as well. And to everyone who's been with us today, thank you for joining us. Any questions, contact the gentleman direct or contact the Chamber and we'll pass it on for you. So thanks very much to everybody. And I wish you, as John said, a safe exiting from lockdown. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.